um, 30 years. I kind of started when I was um, first going through my master's program. Um, and I owe, I've actually been involved with both research as well as early childhood, um, developing uh, um, child assessment measures, program evaluation tools, um, international uh, research, as well as curriculum development. Um, just like Erica, I wear uh, many different hats. I um, oversee the infant and toddler curriculum in training development. Um, I help and assist with the preschool as well as Erica. And um, I also oversee the training of trainers for research, both for certifying and recertifying our trainers. So I'm going to hand this session over to Erica and I will rejoin everyone for the question and answering. Perfect, thank you, Shannon. Um, I also want to acknowledge Christine Snyder from the University of Michigan's Health Systems Children's Center, as well as Eva Hatfield from Gretchen's House. Both of them shared some of their expertise and experiences that they've been having during this time, and we will be sharing some of their ideas um, throughout this webinar. So the layout of our webinar for today is um, going to focus just on two things. We're going to look at how we're supporting families and we're going to look at it kind of like the three C's. So how are we connecting with families? How are we communicating with our families? And then how are we coaching? Um, one of the things you'll hear me say multiple times is that um, how we support families and what we're doing with infants and toddlers during this virtual um, settings that we're in right now, it's, it's going to look a lot different than what we do with our preschool age children. And then we've allowed some additional time at the end for questions and answers. So um, if you have questions that you would like us to address during the webinar, please make sure you add those into the Q&A chat box. So before we get into our three C's, I want to just look at some of our, um, our general family involvement interaction strategies. And so if we look at the first two, being authentic and show that you care, right? Like families know whether we're being authentic or not, whether we're really being genuine and caring about them as well as their children. The third one, remain non-judgmental, right? Like right now, everybody is going through so much. We're all stressed out and we just need to make sure that we're giving some extra grace and being respectful. We're all having to make hard decisions of what's right for our families. And so again, we wanna provide that grace. Um, when we look at partnering with families and building the reciprocal interactions, our relationships with families is a two-way street, right? It should be something where we're learning about them and their child, as well as they're learning about what's appropriate and things that they can do with their child at home. And then the um, last one, um, looking at recognizing the emotional impact of being at home and then providing that positive feedback and encouragement. Just like we do with children, we wanna make sure that we're acknowledging feelings and that we're focusing on strengths, right? Everybody's going through um, stress and different experiences. We, none of us have experienced this before. And so we wanna acknowledge and let families know that they are doing enough. So the first thing that we wanna do with our families is make those connections. So we wanna be actively engaging with our families, which you've probably already started doing, especially if you're back face to face. Um, and in that interaction, we wanna start off with one-on-one -on -one connection. So talking with families individually, and why we talk to them individually, we really want to emphasize the care, the safety, health, and well-being. Again, just check in on our families and see how are you doing during this? What's it like for your family? What are some of the things that you're experiencing? We also suggest that you do this at least on a weekly basis as well. Just checking in and seeing how everyone is doing. During that individual communication, we also want to determine a few different things for each family. What type of support are they going to need, right? Does this family need additional support compared to other families? How often do they want to meet? When do they want to meet? 
are they okay meeting through Zoom or do they still need some of that personal connection and maybe they can still come to your program but you meet outside and you wear a mask and you social distance? What are some of those needs that families might have? Um, Christine and Eva both suggested that you survey families to determine what are the needs and wants that they have for their child's care as well as the education. So you want to think about what are the best days and times to meet with your families and talk with your families. What type of content do they want to know about? What do they want to learn? What things do they want to try with their child? Are there other supports that they need, right? Like as a parent, if my child is needing diapers or food, that's gonna be my priority. I'm gonna be focused on how to get those resources for my child, as opposed to wanting to learn a new way to talk to my baby. And then we also wanna know what are some of those barriers to the participation? Um, maybe they um, need to meet in person because they don't have a computer and so they're not able to meet with um, through a Zoom call or something like that. So again, identifying what those barriers might be. And then when you find out those supports that are needed and those barriers, are there things that your program to, can do to support the family or is there um, a community resource that you could connect to the family with? And so once you um, connect with each of your families and you're connecting with them individually weekly, another um, suggestion that we have is keeping the ongoing engagement with all of your families. Um, so Christine had suggested this town hall um, idea and my children actually did this um, at their school as well. And so if there's a new policy or something that has changed because of CDC guidelines that have came out or some new regulation because of COVID, um, you can send out the policy to families, but then have a town hall, like a Zoom call, where you review the policy and then answer any questions that the families might have. Um, Christine also suggested um, creating some type of question and answer process for families. Is there a form or maybe a certain spot um, that families could drop off questions and then get responses to? And then creating from those questions from the families like a Q&A um, sheet that could be given out to all families. Um, if you are meeting face to face, you are probably have had some changes about drop off and pick up. And so if those locations have changed, for example, some programs are um, having families come to the doors of the classroom by the playground. And so at those drop off and um, pick up locations, having um, your communication boards for your family still in that location. Also thinking about incorporating more um, visual sharing. So whether that's photos or videos, um, you could use Core Advantage storyboards for this. Um, but because families um, typically in most programs aren't allowed into the programs as often as they were before, everything with COVID happened, they're missing out on some of the things that they could watch in the classroom and those kinds of things. So sharing that with families through photos, videos, and those types of things. Also, vary in your mode of communication as needed, right? Like, so how do you communicate with your families already? Maybe your families um, communicate really well through social media and in continuing that um, engagement through those types of um, media. And then helping families and children build connections to one another. Right, because again, they're not in the classrooms like they could be before or seeing each other, maybe at drop off and pick up and having those conversations. And so we want to still build those connections with families. And so we could offer parent meetings and support groups. We could also provide um, opportunities for them to get to know one another. So maybe you could have some virtual activities like creating all about me things using photos or core advantage storyboards that teachers could use to share information about themselves. Or you could encourage families to share photos and videos of the children and the families and the teachers um, introducing themselves or their pets, maybe their bedrooms or their homes or their favorite hobbies, what it is that they like to do. And so you wanna choose ideas based on the comfort levels and the commonalities. 
Another idea, in addition to the parent meetings and support groups, is um, thinking of ways like the social media example I had given earlier, if they really engage in social media, maybe you post questions for families to respond to. So maybe you post like what's for dinner or post a picture of your favorite activity to do with your child might be a prompt that you um, ask parents to respond to. And again, that gives them an opportunity to share ideas, to see, oh, we have the same activity that we like to do together with our child and to make those connections. So those are just a few ideas for connecting and communicating with families. And so now I wanna move into the coaching part, which is where we'll spend the um, remainder of this first section of the webinar on. And so one of the things that we wanna think about with um, coaching families and why this is important, because it is something that we are already doing with our families. We um, are already giving them information about developmentally appropriate practices and ideas of things that they could do with their child at home. But during this particular time, it's even more crucial that we have the um, parents supporting us with the coaching or us supporting parents by coaching so that they can provide rich opportunities for their children at home. And one of the reasons for that is because um, of now having to wear masks, right? So we don't know what the effect of wearing masks are going to have on children and their development, right? This is something that over the next months and years and lots of research that we're going to find out what is the effect on children's development and their caregivers wearing masks. And so because um, caregivers are having to wear masks in the classroom, we want to have our parents to help fill in some of those gaps. Because we know, especially for social and emotional and even language development, infants and toddlers need to see our whole face. They need to see us smiling. They need to see how our mouth forms when we say certain words. And so because some of that won't be happening in our classroom or they won't be able to see it because of the mask, we need families to um, help us fill in that gap. And so um, in order for families to be able to help us fill in that gap, we need to provide them with opportunities of what they can do at home why they're there with their child when they don't have to wear a mask so that the child can see their parent's whole face. So then the question is, well, how do we coach and support our families? And so one of the big things that we want to make sure that we remember when we're coaching and supporting our families is that we're explaining the whys. Why is it that we want them to do this particular activity? Or why is it that we feel that they should use this type of materials within their home with their child? And so when we help, to help parents to understand the whys, we're helping them to better understand the benefits of using that particular material or those activities with their child and what that does for their child's development. And so when we think about the ideas and suggestions that we want to give to our families, we always want to keep active learning at the forefront. Active learning is the heart of the high scope curriculum. And so all of our suggestions and activity ideas that we're going to be giving to families should promote direct hands-on experiences that children can have with people, objects, ideas, and events. And a lot of times we um, focus on materials with infants and toddlers and we will talk about that, um, but one of the best materials that we can give to children is us, right? People are the best interaction play toy that children can have. And so we want um, families to understand that they are the best material that they could give to their child. Um, and just as a reminder, those five ingredients of active learning that we want to make sure are included in everything that we do includes materials, manipulation, so how children use those materials in a variety of ways and using them in their own unique ways. Um, choices that children can make, child language and thought, so um, what children are thinking or even communicating, both verbally as well as non-verbally, 
and then the adult scaffolding and providing that support for the child. And active learning is so important because that's the way that children construct their social, emotional, intellectual, and physical knowledge. Along with keeping active learning as a focus, we need to make sure that we're using appropriate screen time recommendations. So today in your handouts, you will be getting two articles um, from the American Academy of Pediatrics. They come from the healthychild.org website. And so one looks at the American um, Academy of Pediatrics stand on screen time. And so they recommend that for children um, under two years old, that um, if they are using a screen, that it's um, with a parent and that it's a live chat. So for example, um, on social media during COVID, a lot we've seen um, where a parent and a child might be talking to grandparents over Zoom. And so the parent is there with the child and there's a live chat and a conversation going on. Um, for children over two, they recommend that, uh, again, it continues to stay as um, a relationship with the parent and that it's not something where the child takes the tablet or the phone, for example, and goes and uses it on their own. It's something that is still done with the parent. They're co-watching um, whatever it is that they're watching on that particular screen. The other article gives some information um, about recommendations and media use for um, babies, toddlers, as well as preschoolers. And it has a really great um, like graph of why the particular screen shouldn't be given to children at a particular age and um, some of the ways that if you do use media with children, ways that the parent can um, do that together with the child. So those are great resources to share with your families that explains the why and provides appropriate, um, developmentally appropriate screen time recommendations. And so when we look at our coaching strategies for families, we wanna think about these three main things. So the first one is looking at how do we model our interaction strategies and parts of our daily routine. And so we can do this through live conversations with the parent and child together. So again, this would be an appropriate way to use Zoom with a family, with the um, caregiver and the child. So whether that's a parent or a grandparent or um, a nanny, somebody who's there with the child and you're having a conversation with them directly about strategies or parts of the daily routine. You can also do this through tutorials or sharing activity ideas. The second one that we'll look at is sharing resources with families. So um, daily routine ideas, um, handouts that share different strategies and tips that parents can use with their child, as well as actual activity ideas. Also sharing child development and developmentally appropriate expectation resources with families. And then one of the things that we want to make sure that we do for all of these different strategies is that we follow up. A lot of times we um, hand parents a tip sheet and say, hey, try this when you reach your baby tonight or something like that, but then we never follow up and ask like, how did it go? Like, did it work? Did, how did your baby respond? How did you feel when you um, did that particular interaction strategy? So we wanna not only give the support and the ideas, but we wanna follow up and see how it went and do they want additional ideas for that particular um, idea or strategy. So we'll look at our interaction strategies first. And so we have our offering comfort and contact, which would be um, things like tending to the baby when they cry, um, smiling at the baby, cuddling, making eye contact, or interacting and playing with the baby. So this is be things like being present, being on the child's physical level, just enjoying the time spending together, 
and also following the child's lead and acknowledging their choices and preferences. The third strategy that we could use is communicating in a give and take manner. So that would be things like having conversations verbally and non-verbally and labeling what the adult is doing. So as parents play and interact with their child or are doing things around the house, using that self-talk and labeling what it is that they're doing. And these are so important because during the first few years of life, those positive interactions with the caregivers is what's going to develop those healthy attachments. And so young children learn to trust through consistent and responsive relationships with adults. And so these interaction strategies help lay the foundation for all of their future, future learning. And so families can support this attachment and build these relationships with their child by doing these three different things. And so us as teachers, we're going to model what that looks like for them as parents and what it looks like at home. So again, these are things that we can model for families during one-on-one -on -one virtual chats that we could also share them in a tutorial or maybe through a handout or give them ideas for experiences that they could try with their child. And again, don't forget to follow up. Ask them how it went. What did their baby do? How did they respond? You could also share information through family-friendly clips. So as a member of High Scope, you have um, access to a lot of our video clips. So maybe there's a really great interaction strategy on one of our clips that you would like to show families and have them try that at home. Or you could use other um, resources. So this particular video is from the Center on the Developing Child at Harvard University. And so this would be a great video to share with families that talks to them about serve and return. And again, it explains the why. Why is serve and return interaction so important for babies? And what does that do for their brain, right? So it helps build the um, brain. So we're gonna watch this clip and then we're gonna talk about how we might use this clip with families. The key to forming strong brain architecture is what's known as serve and return interaction with adults. In this developmental game, new neural connections form in the brain as young children instinctively serve through babbling, facial expressions, and gestures. And adults return the serve, responding in a very directed, meaningful way. It starts very early in life, when a baby coos and the adult interacts and directs the baby's attention to a face or hand. This interaction forms the foundation of brain architecture upon which all future development will be built. It helps create neural connections between all the different areas of the brain, building the emotional and cognitive skills children need in life. For example, here's how it works for literacy and language skills. When the baby sees an object, the adult says its name. This makes connections in the baby's brain between particular sounds and their corresponding objects. Later, adults show young children that those objects and sounds can also be represented by marks on a page. With continued support from adults, children then learn how to decipher writing and eventually to write themselves. Each stage builds on what came before. Ensuring that children have adult caregivers who consistently engage and serve in return interaction, beginning in infancy, builds a foundation in the brain for all the learning, behavior, and health that follow. So if we think about that information that was just shared in that clip, how could we use that with families, right? So it talked about how we, when we interact with our babies, not only are we building the relationships, but we're actually building their brains and there's connections that are being made. And so maybe we share this with families during a one-on-one -on -one chat. And so we have them watch the video with us 
And then we brainstorm together some of the serve and return interactions that they could have with their baby so that they're thinking more intentionally about those interactions that they're having with their child. Or again, maybe if your families are really into social media, maybe it's something that you post on your Facebook page or whatever group um, page that you might use and you encourage families to watch it and then comment on what things that they feel that they could do to um, increase their serve and return interactions with their child. And again, they're getting lots of ideas from each other, as well as making connections on, oh, I thought about that too, I can do that with my baby. And again, we wanna make sure that we follow up and see how those serve and return interactions went. <laughs> Another idea that we can um, share with families is um, creating their own daily routines at home. And so um, this would be examples of how we can model and share ideas for the daily routine. But again, we wanna explain the why. So why is creating a daily routine at home so important? And so over here on the right, we've listed some of the ideas for why it's important. And these are appropriate for our, our, um, are true for our classrooms as well as for families at home. So it helps children to feel secure. It helps them to have a sense of control because they know what's gonna come next. They know um, what's gonna happen because it's consistently being done. It helps them to develop routines. It helps the visuals help make um, concept of time more concrete, as well as it helps children with transitions. And so this is a list of the high scope daily routine for our infants and toddlers. So high scope infant to toddler teachers use these routines every day in their classroom. And so what we'd wanna do to support our families is help them to understand what does this look like at home? So we can model these parts of the day with our interaction strategies during one-on-one -on -one virtual times with families. We can share ideas for experiences that they could have with their child for each part of the day. So for example, um, in our classrooms, we might do group time with movement and music and um, parents can do that at home with their child as well. So maybe we suggest them using scarves or washcloths and use a song to dance to with their scarves and washcloths from Big Beats from Young Peeps instrumental CD. Or maybe we give them a list of songs that they can sing with their child during diapering or potty training times. Or give them a list of finger plays that they could do with their child during bath time. And again, we would want to follow up and ask them, how did it go and how their baby responded and how did they feel doing those certain activities with their child. We can also help families to create their own um, visual daily routines within their, within their homes, just like we have within our classrooms. So when we have our daily routines posted in our classrooms, not only does it give a visual for children, but it's also a tool that we can use to help children know what to come next. And so today, during our webinars, and in your email that you'll receive tomorrow, you will actually have the link to a downloadable version of the toddler um, routine cards. And so you can use these to support families in creating their own routines at home, or encourage them to take pictures of their child doing parts of a routine. So for example, families can take pictures of a child during their bedtime routine. So maybe a picture of them taking a bath and then putting their pajamas on, and then a picture of them reading a book together, and then a picture of the child laying in their bed. So then the child knows, well, when, I get, when it's time to get ready for bed, I'm gonna take a bath, I'm gonna get my pajamas on, we're gonna read a story, and then it's gonna be time for me to lay down.
When sharing our ideas or experiences for families to have with their child, we must be mindful of the considerations that we need to take for materials. And so these are going, some of these are gonna be program decisions. So are the materials for your infants and toddlers going to be provided by the program? Some um, programs are um, creating like weekly bags of um, materials that they are giving to families that they either um, come and pick up or that programs are dropping off at families' homes and then they bring them back and they get a new bag each week. Maybe your program is doing something similarly or maybe your program doesn't have that availability to offer um, to share materials from the centers into families' homes. So then when you're thinking about materials and giving um, activity ideas, you wanna think about what materials are families gonna have accessible to them in their homes. Um, maybe you wanna provide and create some material list of ideas of things that parents could use with their child um, based on materials and what they could do with those materials. And also um, helping families to think about materials that their children can use that they're interested in. So for example, maybe a child really likes to um, make different sounds. And so what are some of the materials that families could use at home that would help their child produce new sounds? And so even looking at the pictures here, one of the things that we want to keep in mind when we think about materials um, for our infants and toddlers is that we don't need expensive state-of-the-art toys. What toys bring the best play value for children are materials that are real, recycled, and natural. So if you look in the um, bottom picture of the treasure basket, some of the real materials in that basket include the shower curtain rings, the wooden spools, the hair rollers. Some of the recycled materials are the spice container, the metal box. Um, in the top picture, there's lots of recycled bottles and containers that would be great for dumping and filling. And the natural materials, again, down in that um, treasure basket, there's some shells and there's a pine cone. And so those would be the types of materials that we would want to have for our infants and toddlers. And we already know that infants and toddlers love these types of materials because if we think about um, even when they get a gift or something like that, they often choose to play with the wrapping paper and the cardboard box and the ribbons and the bows as opposed to the actual gift that's in the box. Or they love to go into our cabinets and get our pots and pans and our Tupperware containers. And so those are the things that we would want to suggest to families for material ideas to use with their child. Um, sharing resources was our second idea for um, coaching. And so today as well, you're gonna be getting all six of our parent handouts that come from our Let's Play and Learn Together resource. So um, you're gonna get a handout that you can give to your families about interacting with their child, strategies for helping their child become a reader, how to read with their child, how to incorporate active learning at home, um, tips for singing with their baby or toddler, and then tips for including their toddler in self-care routines. So um, again, those will be shared with you through your email tomorrow. Um, but the um, picture over here on the right is the cover of the book that these handouts come from. And so um, in addition to those handouts in this book, you get 30 um, at-home activities for infants and toddlers. So um, if that's something that you feel would be beneficial for your program, to get some activity ideas that you could send home to families, that um, book can be purchased on the highscope.org website. And again, once we hand these handouts to our families and ask them to try these things at home, we wanna make sure that we um, provide some follow-up and ask them how it went and what other support do they need from us based on their experiences of trying out these different tips and strategies. For additional resources, um, you can go to our 
um, highscope.org website. And then if you click on our practice, and then all the way over to the left, click on family engagement. Once you click on family engagement, if you scroll down, um, that's where you'll see some additional resources of activity ideas and um, resources as well as strategies. That's also where you will find um, Big Beats for Young Peeps, which is our instrumental CD. And right now during um, everything that we're going through with COVID, we're offering that as a free resource. So um, like I um, shared the example earlier, if you wanted to have families use washcloths or scarves to dance with their child, and then they could use a song from that CD. Um, and that CD is also great for parents and it won a Parent Choice Award. So that's a great free resource that you could share with your families. And so those are some of the ideas that we wanted to share with you all today um, concerning how to connect, communicate, and coach the families of your um, infants and toddlers. And so now I'm gonna um, stop share my screen and Shannon and I are going to address some of the questions that you all had during the session so far. Thank you, Erica, for the wonderful ideas that we can share um, both as teachers, but also with our families. Um, and everyone is very anxious to um, be able to get a hold of those resources. So we're glad that we're able to share those with you. Um, one of the first questions that came in by Nalita Delgado um, is what is the most effective way to communicate with parents? And I'm thinking um, it's within this uh, COVID time. So what do you, what are your ideas? Yeah, so I think um, the most effective way is going to be um, whatever type of um, mode that your families use the most. Um, and I also think that whatever is available for your family. So um, if your families um, are on social media a lot, then I would tap into that and um, communicate with families that way. Um, if families are um, comfortable with Zoom, um, we've all during this time have had more share of Zoom than we probably have ever wanted in our life. And so maybe um, that's a way that you can interact. I think the biggest thing um, when it comes to communication is figuring out what mode is the most um, beneficial for your families, but then being consistent and um, just making sure that you follow up with families, um, especially the ones where you're um, having a hard time um, connecting with them. So using a variety. So maybe you give them a phone call or maybe you try email and you use social media and you offer Zoom. So having a variety of different options for families to choose from. Um, and, and maybe it is that we ask parents themselves, what's the best way to be able to communicate with you so that we can um, make sure that we're effectively connecting? Um, so um, Erica, there are going to be some qu um, questions in our Q&A, but there are also some ideas that people have shared with us. Um, so some of them will actually be ideas that we can share with everyone, which is, which is great. Um, so uh, if you want to take the next question, then I'll, I'll give you the idea of, of what um, the one is after that. Okay, so um, the next question is, how do you engage your parents virtually? Hmm. That is a good question. And again, it kind of ties back into what Erica just said about um, finding the most um, effective way that is easy for parents to communicate with you. Um, and, and, and it probably would be best when you find a convenient time that parents can actually um, be on a virtual meeting or a virtual um, interaction with you. So again, um, you know, asking them, you know, what's the best time to connect with you and what's the best way to do that? And keep it short because we know parents are very busy um, and we also know that uh, we don't wanna keep infants and toddlers um, online for very long. So um, keeping it short with parents, uh, but ask them. So the next one um, is from Beth O'Connor and, and she's, she gives us some suggestions, but she's also asking um, a, a question. Um, she says, I love the idea of specific, quote, specific ask families. Um, and, and then she says, especially in regard to child assessments. And we've had a few questions that will come later about assessments. 
Um, I'd love, she says, I'd love to hear about how programs are using uh, such as um, a way of connecting with and supporting and even coaching families. And then maybe, you know, how are they doing this even through core? So it's basically kind of coaching and supporting. Yeah. So again, I think um, that coaching and support is really going to be valuable through your one on one interactions with families, um, even if you're doing those through Zoom um, or other um, type of platform. Um, but I think um, during those sessions too, not only are we there to support the families and those interaction strategies and modeling, but we are able to see their baby and how they respond. And so we're able to get an idea of where that child is at based on, you know, whatever it is that we're asking families to try or to do with their baby. And then we're watching how the child responds. And that lets us know where that child is at developmentally, um, even some of their interests and their life that we can um, either use in our lesson planning if we are in the classroom or things that we can think about later on um, when our programs do come back together. Shannon, you have any other ideas for that one? Yeah, so um, kind of like going back to a little bit where you talked uh, about um, interaction strategies and, and when we're interacting um, online with the parent for a few minutes, or maybe it is that we, we, we do a finger play with the parent and show them how to do a, a song or something, um, you know, that's actually coaching families on how to um, talk with their child, how to um, even, uh, you know, sing songs or read books. Um, and again, we know that for the preschool, you know, some of the teachers are actually recording themselves um, um, being able to do something. So maybe that might be a way that, especially getting to those families who are harder to reach, you know, the one question about how do you get parents engaged virtually, you know, maybe it is that you do short tutorials um, and, and talk about, you know, how do you talk to your baby or or how do you help your toddler um, be more independent? Um, and, and so you're sharing these ideas through a short five, 10 minute in, uh, 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 virtual recording that you can make available for parents to, to hear and, and watch at a later time. So that's another way of coaching families as well. So Iris Villar, this kind of goes along with the previous question. Um, uh, they're saying since, since we're remote, is it okay to do assessment on our children, um, like checkpoints for infants and toddlers or preschoolers? So kind of getting back to assessment again. Yeah, so this um, particular question is going to be a um, program decision. Um, some programs have decided to look at um, particular items and those types of things. Um, so we do still um, say that we do need to do assessments with children, but what assessment looks like, um, especially during this time, is going to be a um, program decision. So again, using um, things like core at home and um, encouraging families to interact and do different things with their child and then share that back through the app with you so that you can see those photos and videos um, could be ways to help you collect some of that data or um, like Beth O'Connor had mentioned, you know, giving a specific ask to families and saying, you know, I want you to try this and video it as you do it and send it back to me through the Core at Home app. Um, and so those um, are just a couple ideas of things to think about when we're um, thinking about assessment during this period. Yeah, and other ways to share ideas, you know, maybe you have um, a specific Facebook page that you've developed that's just protected for those, those parents and children that, that you're working with. And, and maybe it is that they don't, maybe you're not using core at home and you don't have that feature, but you could share things through the Facebook. Maybe it is that you ask a parent to try something out with their toddler or an activity that you do with their infant and they take pictures or video and then they can transfer that um, through, fa through fa Facebook as well. Yeah, for sure. Um, so it looks like Christy shared um, a, a good idea. She said, um, one thing that we've done is provided ideas for activities at home. So parents 
and her program are still at home with their children, but the activities align with different parts of the day, but a home version. So sometimes we've had teachers create short videos to talk about those activities and components. And again, this was very much the case when all this started, but still seemed to be a great resource. So that's a great idea. Um, and just like we, like I mentioned in the webinar, so having those tutorials of explaining the different parts of the day, explaining why that part of the day is so important, um, and then giving ideas for families of what those um, parts of the day can look like at home are gonna be super beneficial for your families. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to jump real quick to Beth O'Connor again, who gave another I, really good idea. She says that we created a set of 46 at home learning experiences and she posted them on Core Advantage storyboards and also shared them with teachers as their PDFs. Um, each one includes a specific ask of families and she's willing to share in case that anybody might want to, to looking for some more. So um, if, if this is something that uh, you're, you're interested in, um, maybe we can get Beth O'Connor's um, contact information at some point. Um, so uh, another question is, uh, my toddler is evaluated for um, EL and is currently undergoing speech therapy virtually. Um, she is not comfortable with meeting someone on the phone. So any tips that you might have in connecting instead of the phone? Um, yeah, so I think um, maybe you could try the, um, the virtual one-on-one um, -on -one chatting. Um, so again, that, that is appropriate for young children as long as the parent and the child is there. Um, and so maybe they, the child just needs um, to be able to see the adult um, as opposed to just hearing the voice. Um, yeah, Shan, I, that's all I have for that one. Yeah, it's again, um, I would actually ask, ask the parent, you know, what would they be comfortable with? Um, and, and maybe it is that um, uh, they might meet you somewhere outside where you could interact with the, with the toddler and the parent outside so that, um, you know, there's not this, this, um, so that you're still able to practice the social distancing. So I would talk to the parent and find out what, what are they comfortable with? Because I think that would be very difficult to even model something over the phone without being able to see faces. Um, so it's a good question. Yeah, for sure. All right, and so the next question, Shannon, is um, how do we encourage those parents that say, I just don't have time? I think, again, that goes back to the earlier question about um, parents engaging virtually. Um, it's, it's really, so really finding out what time is the best time for them. Um, maybe it's early in the morning or maybe it's after their, their infant or toddler lays down for a nap. Um, they might have five or 10 minutes. So I would keep it really short and, and ask them when would be the best time to connect with them. Um, and then also give them features and choices or options of you know, hey, would you like to watch this tutorial or would you like to, um, you know, join us on Facebook or, or something like that. So giving them some ideas and options as well. So the next question, Erica, is um, by Lucinda Crawford. Um, how do you keep fam families connected over time? You know, some, she's saying that yeah, families may be drifting away. So how do you keep them engaged over time? Yeah, I, th I think that's a great question. Um, I think consistency and those weekly check-ins are going to be um, really valuable because then it'll be just be something that parents are expecting or even looking forward to. Um, another idea, um, I have a friend at a program and she's had to deal with this. And one of the things that um, she had suggested is that um, her parents that are super involved would um, tr would um, connect with a family that isn't as involved or you know is super busy or whatever and so they kind of made connections so it didn't come directly from the program per se but that um, families were reaching out to each other um, and so I thought that that was a really great idea. And um, they've seen some of the parents who weren't as involved that have now kind of became friends with a parent who um, is involved, is now um, involved even more. So that could be one suggestion. Um, 
So we have, uh, Deborah actually has given another example of being able to share ideas about connecting with families. And um, she says, we're asking families to add a photo onto the Cambu app um, each week. And then they ask um, follow-up questions and then are able to add that to the anecdotes. So sharing, mm -hmm. sharing photos and share, even asking parents to share anecdotes um, of what they see their children doing to, to help you be able to um, build uh, and plan for their development, um, but also really get some form of assessment on those children. Thanks for the idea. So the next question, yeah. um, she says, I'm, Rosalina is asking, I'm currently working with teen parents and is, is very difficult to connect with them. Any suggestions for me or ideas that I could use to help me connect more frequently with families? I think we've shared some ideas on that already. Yeah, I think um, tapping into social media might be a good way. Um, and I, I laugh when I say this because my own kids are teenagers. And so they um, always tell me that Facebook which we've mentioned a couple times, they always say Facebook is for older people. <laughs> and so maybe you need to um, look at other social medias. Maybe you're already doing this, but this is the first thing that came to my mind. So even looking at other um, social media platforms that they're on, maybe Snapchat or um, other things like that, um, to see if you can engage families that way. Um, but I think um, just using some of the same things that we went over of sharing tutorials and um, other video clips will be um, great things um, that you could share with your families. Mm -hmm. I agree. All right, so Shannon, the next question um, says, what's an effective way to convince parents that virtual learning is also helpful um, for toddlers because some parents feel difficult for this age. Okay, so um, as we've talked about throughout this, this webinar and even the webinar um, last week, um, um, we would not agree that virtual learning is helpful for toddlers or infants. Um, you know, uh, we, we've already talked about the, um, you know, no screen time for children, um, you know, two and under. Um, because again, it really rewires the brain when, when infants and toddlers are put in front of screen times. So just like Erica has given some really good examples is that if you're going to be on Zoom or any kind of virtual um, connection with families, that it be one-on-one -on -one with a child and a parent, um, that they're doing it together and you're offering parents some coaching ideas or, or doing some simple song or, or finger play with the child but keeping it short because long periods of time, it's not beneficial for infants and toddlers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's really important to um, not only have parents to understand, but just as educators ourselves. Um, this whole virtual um, situation that we're in now looks very much different for infants and toddlers than it does for preschoolers. With preschoolers, we might um, try to do large group time on Zoom with the kids in our classroom. But with infants and toddlers, we're not going to do that. Like that's not um, developmentally appropriate. It doesn't align with the screen times. Um, we know that um, based on screen time recommendations that those one-on-one -on -one virtual times with the parent is there with the child and the teacher for, like Shannon said, for a short amount of time is what we would expect to um, provide a virtual, um, appropriate virtual experience for our infants and toddlers. Yeah. So we, um, we've talked a little bit about connecting with parents and, and I'm seeing some, some things that are being shared in, in chat um, where, where teachers are getting exhausted because some parents just aren't connecting. And, and I have to agree with Michelle Lopez, you know, don't give up, you know, Donna, keep continuing to, to offer um, help to parents, um, helpful tips to them, you know, just make sure that they know that, that you're available and you're willing to help them. That's all we can do. Um, because again, it's the children that we want to reach as well. Um, so, so just keep, keep up the good work and, and just know that it, it'll be effective at some point. Um, Zorianda um, gave a, a, a suggestion again of being able to help um, uh, just ideas of, of being able to get children engaged and she said she runs a nutritious program um, for
for uh, preschoolers and they are actually um, helping them to adopt healthy eating habits as well. So a question for you, Erica, is um, any suggestions for families um, who do who do who do want to do virtual, but also say, oh no, yet again, another virtual meeting. I mean, we all know, um, and there's even research already showing up that um, there is a, a virtual um, uh, exhaustion um, or, or Zoom, Zoom exhaustion um, that's already out there. Um, so she says, since they have older children and are doing um, these online classes with their older kids, so now the parents are overwhelmed with all these virtual connections. Um, but they do want to do face-to-face. -face. So what would you encourage? Okay, and he says, but they do not want to do face-to-face. -face. Oh, they do not, oh, sorry, they do not want to, yeah. Yeah, so I think um, maybe with these particular families, maybe you use the idea of the handouts um, that has the tips and suggestions or an activity idea, or maybe you give them um, one of the um, short video clips like the um, video clip I showed uh, in the beginning part of the webinar. Um, so maybe just change the um, type of way that you're giving them the information. Because like Shannon said, we're all kind of <laughs> Zoom fatigued. So um, that's all the time that we have for questions. Um, I'm gonna share my screen one last time. There's gonna be a couple other slides that I want to go over with you all. Shannon, thank you for helping us answer all of these questions that um, people have shared. And so um, I just wanted to share with you all, our next live event is happening next week. And so our registration is open. You can register at highscope.org slash roundtable. And so that's going to take place October 21st at two o'clock. Um, and it's going to be um, focused on um, driving racial justice in early childhood classrooms. So it's um, based off of Ioma's book called Don't Look Away. So you wanna make sure you register register for that. Um, we want to, um, again, thank you for attending with us today. You are going to get your certificate of attendance emailed to you, as well as the handouts and the link to the daily routine cards for our um, toddler daily routine cards, um, as well as the recording. Here are some other free resources. So um, you can check out some previous recorded webinars, um, post something on our blog, follow us um, at Highscope US, and um, also uh, join our membership if you haven't already done that. And that is um, a free resource that has lots of great things for you to use. Have a great one. We'll see you soon.